Hallelujah. I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour. It is a good day. It's a wonderful day. Things are happening all over the world. We don't know how many balloons will show up today. And, but it gives everybody the, you know, it gives everybody some excitement, I guess. But there'll be balloons showing up and all these kind of other things showing up. And, and we don't know what all might transpire today. But we know one thing. At the end of the day, it makes no difference. Our God is still God. And he's the only God and there is no other God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. You know, I was going to read you something. That's why I'm flipping through the pages here. If I could find it. And, um, yeah, so, yeah, maybe it's right here. Yeah, you know, what we were talking about before we went to the, uh, the music stopped, we were talking about quoting the founding fathers. And, um, I said this not long ago to a group of leaders and, um, you listen to this. It says, can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we remove their only firm basis? It is the conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God, that they are not to be violated but with his wrath. Indeed, I tremble for my country, and I reflect that God is just, and his justice will not sleep forever. Who said that? Thomas Jefferson said that. The one that everybody claims he's the most, you know, unreligious founding father we have, him and Benjamin Franklin. But yet we find quotes like that by them. And so he said, I tremble for my nation that our God is just and his justice will not sleep forever. And I said this, I said, if his justice can't sleep forever, then we must ask ourselves, what happens when it awakes? Is a, and I said this, I said, is, does America believe, could we take the justice of God? Nay. Have we come to the place where we think we're immune to it? Yes. Yes. But we're not. And so we have to stand. And the only reason people say, you know, well, God's going to have to, if he don't judge America, have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's, that's not true. Here is the thing. Let me tell you why. It's because the reason this nation hasn't been uh, come under the harvest of judgment yet, it is because, oh, you've seen pockets of things go wrong, but not the judgment yes, uh, yet, not the justice waking up. And the reason it is is because God made, a, it's the same agreement he made with Abraham concerning Sodom and Gomorrah. He said if there's ten righteous there, he would spare the city. And so there wasn't ten there. There were only four, and only three of them actually made it out. So there's in ratio of believers, there's a lot more than ten still in America. There's a lot more than 10 in your nations. There's a lot more than 10. And so it's like we're screaming at God when we bring in these transgenders and we bring in and the mutilation of children's uh, bodies and we do all these kind of things and we abort enough babies to fill nine Midwestern states in this country. And we do things like that. Surely we're shaking the justice of God, saying, wake up, wake up and judge us. And groggily, the justice of God will, will come and, and open his eyes and look around and ask you, is there still 10? And the answer is yes. And then he goes to sleep again. The justice sleeps again and says, wake me when there's four. So surely this is the place we're operating in right now. This is why it has never fallen yet. And it will not as long as there's that ratio screaming out righteousness, righteousness, righteousness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a good thing. It's a good thing, isn't it? It's a good day to be alive. Somebody hand me that phone right there. 
I, I typed some notes on it I want to read today. Uh, yeah, right there. Yeah, hand me that. I didn't have a notebook in my hand. Well, I had one, but I, it was so urgent I had to, to write it quickly. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, this is what I heard the Lord say. It's the greatest day of espionage we've ever seen. It is the year of the war of deception. It is the year of the battlefield of the glory. It is the year that Jesus, the Jesus revolution will begin. It is the year of the war between darkness and light. It is the year that the enemy is going to try uh, and fool the people concerning Christianity. It is the year that uh, that this, uh, I've got to figure out how I type this. It is the year that the Catholic Church will speak out in support of UFOs. It is the year that even the very elect could be fooled. It is the year that organized religion that has held people in cultural bondage for so long will lose its grip. It is the year of saber rattling while under the table deals are made. It is the year that China will be double crossed by its American operatives. It is the year, my brother and sister, it is the year that Soros loses. It is the year of mistrust, especially with them. You can either join the Jesus revolution or go down in history of fighting against it. Now, the Lord has a word for those who attack his servants. And I want to put it up. It's Job 38, verse 2. This is the word. And you would do well to hearken to it. it said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel? by words without knowledge. Who is this that darkens counsel with words without knowledge? And the Lord said this, Take heed lest your reward only be the satisfaction you gain from the attack in this life. And this is the things the Lord has told me this morning to tell you. So, it is the time of decision. It's the time to decide what side we're on. It is that time. Now, I'm going to say something that I've said before, but this is what's on my heart. It's in St. John chapter 1. I want you to, uh, to turn there if you can. Put it on the screen. St. John 1 verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, Lord, I ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear that we can learn your Word together as a family. I give you praise and honor and glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, the Word, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So this right here is final authority. You have to remember that. All prophetic utterances are subject to this. All gifts of the Spirit are subject to this. Everything is subject to the written Word. Now we need to get that in our thinking to the place because there's times confusion will try to come in your mind and there's times that the enemy will try to raise up uh, you know, and, and sound and make a confusing sound and, and it'll get hard to hear. So you go back to the final authority. You go back to the written word. The written word is always the same. It's always the same. And so you go back to that. You, you stay on that. It is final authority. And it's the only thing because all prophecy comes out of there somewhere. You may not know where, and you may not even know what Bible code that's in, in the Hebrew or the Greek. You may not know how it flows in the Scripture, but it's there. It's a complete book. It's not a piece of God's knowledge. It's God in written form. Now, you need to get that in your thinking. Once that becomes final authority for you, you'll stop looking outside it for something to validate it. 
this validates anything else you see or it's not true. So it's the only thing strong enough to hold the, the weight of a prophetic word. It's the only thing strong enough to protect you in the middle of a world that is bent on destroying Christians. It's the only thing that's big enough to do that. Hallelujah. Think about it. You're in a world now where for the first little sign of a streak across the sky, and you've got thousands and thousands of people ready to believe they're intergalactical aliens coming. I mean, you know, hey, Brother Robin, you know, there's got to be UFOs. Why, yeah, I could throw this pick up in the air and nobody see what it was, and they'd say, there goes a UFO. It's a pick flying through the air. But I knew what it was. And if there is, you know, and I look at this kind of stuff, I think, well, if there's, if there's aliens on other planets viewing us all the time and they're so superior to us, why don't they just land at the White House and just get out and say, we're here, we're here, and we come to tell you how stupid you all are. Why don't they just land? They could email us. We've got an email. They could call your cell phone. They could ring every cell phone in the world right now if they're, that, if they're really there. Well, Brother Robin, you know they're there. Well, you would have thought that the, them balloons they shot down was that too. We've got to, what would you do, man? You know, if you're going to talk to me about intergalactical travel, then you need to show me a picture of a UFO that don't have rivets on the side of it. That if I got close enough, it may say made in Detroit. I don't know. But you need to show me something. When that big thing came across Houston, when they zeroed in on it, it had rivets and bolts. Show me something that's different than that. You see, people are already, they have fueled it for deception. Oh, boy, I didn't know I was going here today, guys. But here we are, here we are, and here's the pint. <laughs> it's not intergalactic travel. These things that you see are, are very advanced things are, you know, they, they don't have bolts and rivets. And, and the lights, you ever notice the lights all look like our aircraft? I mean, they look just like them. And, but here is what's happening. How could governments build such advanced machinery unless they're contacting the spirit world and those spirit beings are giving them the technology to do it. You know, in the ancient Egyptian world, they had what was called, uh, on the hieroglyphs, you could see something they called the boat of a million years. And they called it a tower, the boat of a million years, or a tower. And what it was is it would show this boat-looking thing but it had little tornadoes on each end of it. And people used to think it was tornadoes. But it turns out they're wormholes. And it was a machine that would collect energy and bend light. And they said they would bring up spirits from the other side through one wormhole and bring them Osiris and, and Set out on the other side. I believe it was Set, they said. And they would bring them into this world. And they would learn these things contacting the other side. And so now you see network television showing satanic worship services. You see people riding, wearing I love abortion pins. You see the arches of Baal going up all over the world. You see satanic rit uh, uh, worship and rituals being shown everywhere. And now you're starting to see where they're getting the technology from. Well, it's just science, Brother Robin. Then why didn't they build it on the temple of Apollo? 
Why did they build CERN on the Temple of Apollo? Why would they have the god Shiva outside the door? Why did the World Health Organization have the god Shiva on their table when they met with China in, I think, 2017? Why would they do this? Don't you know from day one they stuck the shovel in the ground? They knew that was the Temple of Apollo. And Revelation chapter 9 says that, that when the bottomless pit is open, they have a king over it named Apollyon or Apollo. And CERN says we're trying to open a portal so something may step through it and do some satanic ritual, and that was a ritual. And you say, well, you know, these are aliens intergalactical. No, they're interdimensional spirits that are being contacted, giving people technology to do what they do. Yeah, Brother Robin, that's wild as a deer. Yeah, that's wild as a deer. And, and people that teach about UFOs everywhere, they're not. I mean, you got these little ET guys running around sticking their fingers out, and you think that's not wild? It's, all that looks like little monkey-like creatures. Every time I've seen a demon, it kind of looks like that. Or not every time, but most of the time. So we have to start basing everything we believe right here. It has to be here. If not, you will be fooled. You will surely be fooled. Well, you know, Brother Robin, I, I don't know about all this stuff. Well, let me tell you. Let me educate you about some of it. You know, I remember one time I was laying hands on people, just praying for them in this service years ago, and I, I, they were coming by, or I was coming by them, however it was going. We had a prayer line. You know, it's just where you line up people and pray. And I'm just praying and be blessed in the name of Jesus, be blessed in the name of Jesus. And I laid my hands on a deacon of the church. And he was about this tall. He was a little guy. I mean, I don't mean that uh, derogatory. He was just, he was... You know, he was a real neat guy, and he was, he weighed about 135 pounds, five foot seven. I remember because I asked. And he, I laid hands on him and said, be blessed. And when I did, he just dropped his head like that. And he, he started backing up. And I'm standing there looking at him. And then he starts hissing like a snake. And, and saliva started coming out of his mouth. We say slobber in Alabama, but saliva started coming out of his mouth. And he was hissing. And I told the pastor and the youth pastor, they were big guys. I said, grab him. And they grabbed hold of his arms, man, and they couldn't hardly hold him. He just, he just moving around. And then I told him, I, I looked at him, I said, come out of him in the name of Jesus. Boom, he hit the floor. And when he hit the floor, he started writhing like a serpent. He was just kind of wiggling around like that. But I told that thing to come out of him in Jesus' name. And all of a sudden, man, he went down. He gets up, and his mind is clear, and he's absolutely free. Never remembered anything about that. Didn't even know what happened. Now, what was that? That's one of them ET things. <laughs> That's what that is. That's what one of them are. That's it. You know, there was a, there was a um, remember my sister used to tell this story. There was a, a, a person went to minister to someone in a mental institution. And she was sitting there, and, and, and she just had this lipstick drawing all over her face like this. And, and the woman was trying to minister to her, trying to pray for her, and then she couldn't get through, so she didn't know what else to do, so she just stopped and started praying in the other tongues, just started praying in the Spirit. And the minute she started praying in the Spirit, that woman drawing on her own face like that stopped and looked at her and growled out at her and said, you speak in a language that we can understand. What was that talking out of her? That's one of them little E.T. things that had their fingers stuck out like that. That's, that's one of them. And they all respond to the name of Jesus. They don't care about any other name. You could stand there and scream at a demon-possessed person in the name of Buddha all day long, and they'd never respond to you. 
But the minute you use that name, suddenly, man, power comes on the scene. Because he is the Word made flesh. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Now, and, and in Philippians 2, 9, 10, and 11, you can read that. Put that on the screen. Philippians 2, 9, 10, and 11. And look at this. Look at this with me. We're, we're, you know, I just feel like we should look at some of this stuff. Now, it says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, Jesus, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, you see that? That's the name that everything bows to. And that's the name they seek to stop. That's the name that they do this stuff with. You let somebody get on television, you let somebody get on some, somewhere and start talking about Jesus and suddenly you'll see some of them, you know, they just suddenly go off because that's the name that everything else has to bow to. So we have to base everything on the word as final authority. It says, without him was not anything made that was made. St. John 1 verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness couldn't hold it down and seize upon it. Couldn't comprehend it. King James says comprehended it not. It means hold it down. So there's a war. There's a war over that name. And this is the year that decides what comes in the future. Don't be fooled by what aliens are. Don't be fooled by these things. These are spiritual beings that are giving technology to man, and this is the same spirits that people like Hitler was in contact with. That's why he had the saucer things he had. That's why he had the technology he had. He was in the occult. That's why he wanted the things he wanted, the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Grail, all these things. That's why he was trying to create a super race. Same thing Nimrod or anyone else did. So the light shined in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. Make up your mind this year. Make up your mind right now. This Bible is final authority. This is final authority in my life. Whatever it says, I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. And don't let these spirits come into your life this year and begin to fool you. They're already talking about UFOs, and they're trying to break it out over the line, and they're trying to make a deception about something that's shaping up. And all Christians want to do is fight. Then it goes and says this, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. That's the prophet. So you have the word, the war, and the prophet. And then it comes down here, and listen what it says. What is the purpose of the prophets being on the scene? It said the same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. So now you know prophets are on the scene to bear witness of the light. Oh, there's so many deep things we could talk about right now. The realm that prophets walk around in. The realm they live in. The realm they see over into. We could talk about that light. It keeps talking about light, light. Anything above the speed of light is in the spirit world. Anything below the speed of light is in our world. And so prophets, they go beyond the light line and they see things that you can't see with your normal eyes. And they look at it and they start looking like this and telling you what, they, what they're looking at. They'll see it and tell you what they saw. And people that out here that don't see it will call them crazy. Say, That's not true. That's not true. Well, how do you think Isaiah was going to describe some of the things he saw? Don't you know people in his day t thought he was a nut because he would give absurd prophecies. 
All he knew is, is things that move from the east to the west like lightning. What about when you see things like in Psalm 91, a thousand can fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand. With this, you won't be afraid of this arrow that flies by day. Who in his day would have thought there would have been anything that looked like an arrow that could kill a thousand at one time and 10,000 at one time? But now we know there's missiles that look just like one that could do that just like that. So you have to remember, the prophets are here to bear witness of the light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory." The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word, the war, the prophet, and the glory. The word, the war, the prophet, and the glory. Stop the prophet and you stop the ones bearing witness of the light. You would stop the, the witness of the light that's coming and has come into the world. So the word, the war, the prophet, and the glory. And so we need to remember that. So this year, gather up your courage and fight. Gather up your courage to believe. Gather up your courage and don't be pulled off of the word. Stay with the word. Stay with the word. Hallelujah. Well, Lord, I didn't plan on doing that, but I will if you tell me to. I want you to put up Job 38 again. And the Lord had said something about those who attack who attack what God is doing and, and so forth in this world at this time. Now, I want you to see this. For those who attack the Lord's servants, starting in verse 2, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Just keep going. Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will, demand, uh, I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it broke forth as if it had issued out of the womb. When I made the cloud the garment thereof and thick darkness a swaddling band for it. And break up for it my decreed place and set bars and doors. And said hitherto shalt thou come but no further. And here shall thy proud waves be stayed. Hast thou commanded the morning since the days and caused the day spring to know his place? That it may take hold of the ends of the earth that the wicked might be shaken out of it? It is turned as clay to the seal and they stand as a garment. And from the wicked their light is withholden and the high arm shall be broken. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Or hast thou walked in the, search, uh, in the search of the depth? Have the gates of death been opened unto thee? Or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? Hast thou perceived the breadth, the breadth of the earth? Declare if thou knowest it all. Where is the way where light dwelleth? And as for darkness... Where is the place thereof? That thou shouldest take it to the, to the bound thereof, that thou shouldest know the paths to the house thereof. Knowest thou it because thou wast, uh, because thou wast then born? 
or because the number of thy days is great? Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow? Imagine that, treasures of the snow. Or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? I mean, you think about it. Can you take the, do you know how God uses hailstones to fight in a battle? Or what is the treasures of the snow? By what way is the light parted, which scattereth the east wind upon the earth? Who hath divided a water course for the overflowing of waters, or a way for the lightning of thunder? To cause it to rain on the earth where no man is, on the wilderness where there is no man. To satisfy the desolate and waste ground, and to cause the bud of the tender herb to spring forth. Hath the rain a father? Or who hath begotten the drops of the dew? Out of whose womb came the ice and the hoary frost of heaven? Who hath gendered it? The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades, or loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season, or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? Canst thou lift up thy voice to the clouds, that abundance of waters may cover thee? Canst thou send lightnings that they may go and say unto thee, Here we are? Who hath put wisdom in the inward parts? Or who hath given understanding to the heart? Who can number the clouds in wisdom? Or who can say, who can stay the bottles of heaven? When the dust groweth into hardness, and the clods cleave fast together, wilt thou hunt the prey for the lion, or feel the appetite of the young lions? When they couch in their dens, and abide in the covert to lie and wait, who provideth for the raven his food, when his young ones cry unto God, they wonder for lack of meat." Now, you think about all of that. That is what God says. He says, do you know those things? Do you understand all of that? You darken counsel with, the, with, with your words that you don't even know. You have no knowledge. All of the things I just read in Job 38 is where prophets walk around in. That's why you hear them say things that are so strange sounding. They will walk around in those things, and they'll see things within those things that make these things move and happen, and they may not even understand it themselves. When Jesus was on the earth, what did Jesus say? He said, when the coming of the Son of Man will be like the lightning from the east to the west. And he said, two will be in the field, one taken and one left. Two will be in the bed sleeping, and one taken and one left. Has it ever dawned on you that there wasn't any night shift in those days? There was no night shift. And when it got dark, people went to bed, but yet he said two would be in the field. At the same time, two would be in the bed sleeping. He was telling the people that the earth is in hemispheres, and it's light on one side when it's dark on the other side. And he was talking about things. Man, we didn't even understand gravity till an apple fell off a tree and hit somebody. I mean, we didn't even know where those things, how these things even work. We didn't even know how to start examining things like that. But Job, being a prophet, did. He studied the stars. He understood the heavens. He knew things. He said things. God talked about the morning stars singing together, talking about the archangels. He talked about in the beginning when they laid the foundation, he laid the foundations of the earth, how they shouted. And he asked the question, do you know these things? 
And so when you see prophets talk about things that are wild sounding, they're walking around in that world. And if you're going to criticize and ask them, how do you know that? 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 Right there, that one chapter could validate it all. Because you don't know what it takes to make these things happen. You don't know what he's talking about in the spirit. So we have, and that's just one chapter. One. What happens in, in the book of Psalms, and I think, what is it, 139, when, when he says, you made me, when you made me in your underground workshop. He talks about when God made him in his underground workshop. What is that talking about? Underground. Oh, it's just pretty poetry. No, it's the Word of God. And it has a meaning deeper. A lot deeper than a zebra can understand. It's supposed to be men seeking after Him. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. But it is the honor of a king to search that matter out. And He fastened him in His underground workshop. He's talking about in Genesis 1. Verse 11, when he planted everything that had seed within itself, when he cast his own image in the wet earth. And then Genesis 1, and on day six, that was on day 3. And then on day 6, he uncovered the earth, laid on that cast of himself, and raised that man up out of a grave and prophesied the resurrection that would come. Prophesied that one day he would take an image of a man himself and die and raise up. And day one, or day three to day six is when that happened to Genesis 1. And that's three days and three nights. It's all a prophecy. And David picked up on it when he said, you, you made me in your underground workshop. Think about that. And so that's the realm that prophets move in. That's what they see. That's what they're talking about. And a lot of that they can't even answer themselves because they keep looking. And all a prophet does is what he's told. And he's the servant or she's the servant of God themselves, the servants of the Lord, an officer from the court of heaven. Isaiah goes to Hezekiah. And Isaiah says this to Hezekiah, Get your house in order, for thus saith the Lord, you shall surely die. It's a sure thing. You have had it, man. It's over. Get your house in order. And he turns and walks out of the king's presence, and he walks out through the court. And did you notice that it was a prophet had access to the king at any time? So he's walking out and the Lord speaks to him. Why? Because Hezekiah turns his face to the wall and he starts crying out to the Lord, Lord, remember my righteousness, not my wrong. And Isaiah hears the word. Go back and tell Hezekiah, I've given him 15 more years. And he turns and heads back. And he, gives, he tells him the word of the Lord. Now, Isaiah don't know what's happened between that time. He just goes back. But if that wasn't recorded, you would have called Isaiah a false prophet because Isaiah said you'll surely die, but he didn't. Or you would have tried to explain it 15 years later, he meant. But it was recorded so you could see the realm of prophecy given to men involves the decision of the man most every time, most every time. The water couldn't argue with Jesus because it was an element. The only ones that he ever asked, do you believe I can do this, was a man. So you, you're looking at the realm prophets walk around in, and all they know is what they hear. But the things in Job 38, they're looking into. Job studied them. 
He just look into them. And the Lord told Job, said, there's a lot you don't know. Can you do all of this? Can any of you do all of this? Can you tell me how all of this works? Can you? Well, of course they couldn't. They couldn't. But that's the realm that prophets walk in. That's the realm that they operate in. That's it. That's the way it is. That's in Psalm 139, 15. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. And one translation says, in your underground workshop. Talking about casting his body underground. So we have to, you have to remember that. And what is a prophet doing? Well, one thing we read today, a prophet is bearing witness of the light. They're not the light, but they're bearing witness of the light. Even though believers are the light. Oh, I know, I know. You say, well, Brother Robin, this, this turned from one thing. You went from one thing to another thing to another thing. Yes. Yes, I did. Because the Lord said, go from one thing to one thing to one thing to one thing. So that's exactly what I did. So we are in the year of decision, the year that it's all laid out on the floor, and you can decide what you want to believe. But it's remember, it's the Word. Don't forget the written Word. You can do nothing without it. Don't let anybody tell you that you have to have a book added to this book in order to understand what God really meant. Don't do that. Anything that violates a scripture in here is wrong. It's wrong. The scripture, one thing I love about, I mean, I love everything about the scripture. But I'm going to tell you something. The scripture don't hide it, good, bad, or ugly. It just tells it. Tells it just like it is. And then he tells you how to walk around in it, how to live in it, how to do. And you have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And the office of each one is so vitally important to what God is going to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. But you know, it seems like only prophets and teachers suffer the most about it. False teacher, false teacher. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, it's always false prophet, false teacher. Well, I want to educate you on something. Um, if they teach Jesus Christ, born of the virgin, grew up the spotless, sinless Lamb of God, died the death of a sinner with our sin for us. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us. He went into hell, paid the price, rose again after three days and nights, and seated at the right hand of God the Father. And if they teach that and confess that, they're not false teachers. And if a prophet prophesies the word of God and points you to the word, then he's not a false prophet. Now let me tell you this. A false prophet, you can find one easy. God, I'm, and God showed us one. I think about it, there's one on the scene right now that you could look at every day just in case you get confused. His name is Yuval Noah Harari. Now, you can just pull his picture up and stare at him and look at him, and you're going to see, wow, so that's what a false prophet looks like. Yeah, that's him right there. That's him because he says, you know that Jesus Christ rising from the dead is fake news. Now enough of this enough of this trash is enough. While while all the world is going on, all the world's in a fight, all the world we're, we're on the brink of World War 3, where all this stuff is happening right now around us and the church now that that the church is going to have to decide what they believe. So just decide. Decide and walk on and just love everybody and just keep moving. But I can't stop preaching. I've got to keep telling you, and we're in the realm of decision right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The word, the war, the prophet, the glory. So, uh, you know, I remember uh, an old television show back in the 70s. Here comes the bride. You remember that? Here come the brides. Y'all remember that? It was something that 
and uh, I think Bobby Sherman played on it. Y'all remember him? Nobody remembers him? <laughs> yeah, I think he played on it. Here comes the bride, or something to that effect. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Here comes the glory. Here comes the glory. It's coming on in, and the glory will invade the halls of Congress, and the glory is going to come in like a mist right there in the middle of it, and de demon-possessed congressmen are going to manifest right there in front of everybody. You're going to see some of them react, and don't be surprised if suddenly there's a, there's a session of Congress on television, and it's the same old boring sound with the gavel and all this stuff going on, and all of a sudden in the back you hear somebody say, Bleh! and all because the anointing's going to come on the floor, and it's going to draw these demons out into the public for everybody to see. Don't be, don't be surprised when that happens. Don't be surprised when meltdowns happen on television. Don't be surprised when suddenly you start seeing things manifest from God in the realm of men and it's on national television and before they can delete it out, before they can stop it, before they can squelch it, before that can happen, suddenly it's going to happen anyway and people are going to hear the gospel. Hallelujah. Well, that's all today. It's been a wonderful 11th hour today, don't you think? Been really, really good. Very, very, very good. You know, what was it Ed Sullivan used to say? It's a really big shoe. <laughs> well, this is not a shoe. It's not a show, but it has been a really big day. Amen. Don't be afraid and uh, don't get, you know, don't get all bent out of shape if four or five more balloons show up. Just, just know this, that, uh, that your God is still God. And I guarantee you God didn't say, I God, it's a China balloon. I guarantee you it didn't surprise him at all. It just didn't. <laughs> well, praise God. But it is serious prophetically. Because, you know, I gave a prophetic word back in 2019. There's more of that word that we haven't posted yet that happened later on in that thing I gave about a balloon, and I saw it. In 2019, I saw this balloon, and I, I saw it. And, and, and later on, I started talking about blimps. I saw these blimps, and I couldn't figure out what they were. But I remember saying, and you'll hear me say it on the rest of it about the blimps when I said, this thing is far off from me. It's way out there yet. and uh, But I, I even called it a, I said, I see this hot air balloon. This hot air balloon. This is in 2019. And it, I remember how it would come up in my spirit. And I said, it's a hot air balloon. And then another 11th hour, I said, it's, it's a, I saw this whisper. It's a hot air balloon. It's like a whisper just went across in front of me. It was a whisper of a hot air balloon. Well, they called it a spy balloon, a whisper balloon. And it went across, and I was seeing from 2019 to 2023. And so there's other things I saw, blimps and things like that. So keep your prophetic ears open. Keep your eyes open. Hallelujah. God is God, and you are his family. Now, if you don't know him as Lord, make Jesus Lord of your life right now. Do it right now. Don't wait. Do it right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart. God raised you from the dead. Come on, say it. I believe in my heart, Jesus, that God raised you from the dead. And I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord. Say it out loud. Say, I don't call it mistakes in my life. I call it what it is, sin. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Wash me clean of that. And from this day forward, you are my Lord, and I'm a brand new creation. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, all things are passed away, and all things will become new, and all things are of God. How about that? Verse 21 says, you know that you've been made the righteousness of God in him. 
He who knew no sin was made to be sin with us. For us, uh, him who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. So say it. Now I'm the righteousness of God. I'm right with God. There's nothing wrong between me and God. And just say to him, Lord, speak to me. I'm listening. Hallelujah. And then get you a Bible and start looking at it, reading it. Read St. John chapter 1, first of all. And then read the whole book of St. John, man, and let the Lord start talking to you. A Jesus revolution is about to begin. Hallelujah. And we want to be part of it. So go ahead now that you got saved and speak in tongues. Be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Say, Jesus baptized me in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And then just say, thank you for it, Lord. And then just start doing it. Come on, everybody in the, in the fortress here, begin speaking in tongues. Lord, I ask you to let somebody in the halls of Congress just speak in tongues on camera. Hallelujah. I ask you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, Krista. Tell us how to prosper today. It's been a good 11th hour. Good 11th hour. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, happy Valentine's Day, 11th hour family, or as the kids used to say, Valentine's. Happy Valentine's. We love you. And, you know, it's just like the church posted today. In 1 John 4, 19, it says, we love because he first loved us. So we love you, and Jesus loves you. Well, we're not closing yet, so don't finish that. But, but it is offering time here on the 11th hour. So if you would like to give, the ways to give are on the screen, or you can find those at robindbullock.com. And, you know, Psalm, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this up right here. You know, Psalm, Psalm 103 talks about the blessing of the Lord also. But this particular scripture, and I've got it pulled up, but I've got so many apps on this phone. And I got a new phone, and I don't know how to work it. So I need my nieces to come show me how to work it. <laughs> and so, but in Proverbs, I had Psalms pulled up, but in Proverbs 10, 22, it says, The blessing of the Lord makes rich. And he adds no sorrow with it or to it, whichever. The King James says the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. I had a dream, and this is going to be very, very short today, but I had a dream uh, about a month or so ago, maybe a month and a half ago, and I was preaching in my dream. And I told the congregation, I said, I said, when the blessing of the Lord is within you, I said, it repels any offense of the curse. It repels any offense of the curse. Well, what is an offense of the curse? Poverty. Poverty is an offense of the curse. You know, everybody in this, in this day and age is getting offended over everything. They're offended over everything. I could drop this pick on the ground and somebody would get offended over it if they watched it. How dare you drop that pick down on the floor? It's just, I remember a long time ago, remember when that big offense wave and movement came through and somebody just posted on social media a picture of a squirrel and it said, here is a picture of a squirrel today so that you may get offended. <laughs> like, it was just so ridiculous. Well, the curse is offended at the blessing that's within you. Because if you are a believer and you have Jesus, and those of you that just said that prayer, and you invited Jesus to live on the inside of you, the curse is now offended at you. Because why? Because it can't overtake you. Because the blessing repels any offense of the curse. It repels it. And it just pushes it. So we have to, as believers, be conscious to not let ourselves get in offense. Because when you let yourself get in offense, you are now operating under the curse. And the blessing cannot do its job in your life. 
And so we have to guard ourselves against offense. You know, Brother Jesse Duplantis said one time, you can hurt my feelings, but you cannot offend me because I will not let offense. Why? He don't want the curse working for him. The curse is sickness. The curse is poverty. The curse leads to death. He says in the scripture, he sets before us blessing and curse, life or death. You choose. It says choose life so that you and your seed may live. That's under the blessing. Life is. Spiritually, physically, and financially. But everything that does not pertain to life I, I'm, I'm quoting my, my healing confession in my head of all matter that does not pertain to life or health. And so if it does not pertain to life up under here, then it's of the curse. The scripture tells us what the enemy does and it tells us what God does. It tells us who is the blesser and who is the curser. And so when we let the blessing of the Lord operate within us, whether we're, you know, we just may, as my dad says, have never felt so normal in all my life. You may just be walking down the street, but the blessing of the Lord is so within you and you're walking in love, it's repelling things away from you constantly and you can't even see it. You don't even know. One day we'll look back on all the times that the blessing was working for us in our life and we didn't even know it. It was just, it was repelling sickness. It was repelling poverty. It was repelling death and tragedy and destruction off of you. But when we let the first step to operating and kicking the blessing to the curb is getting offended. So we need to guard ourselves during this time. Listen, when that Jesus revolution hits, you're going to have every opportunity to get offended. Every. Why? Because people are going to come and they don't look like you. And they don't talk like you. I'm going to tell you what, southern people and northern people, we love each other so much, but our personalities are completely and totally different. They're different. Why? Southern people, we would jump over this podium for you if we thought we hurt your feelings. Like, and we'd just fall in the floor. Please forgive us. Please forgive me. That's, that's Southern people. And we, I love our church because our church has everybody. All right, we are Church International. And so then you've got people coming that say stuff that to a, to a Southerner might sound as what we call smart aleck. And Southerners go, I can't believe they said that to me. Are you kidding me? And you will literally, you will literally overthink it for the next week. And then when you finally go up to that person and talk to them, they don't even know what they said. Because in their heart, they didn't mean nothing by it. It was just the way it came out of their mouth. We're going to experience this when the Jesus revolution happens because you're getting all kinds of kinds. So don't get offended. Walk in love so that you're operating in the blessing. Just choose the blessing so that you and your seed may live. Amen. Amen. So I choose the blessing today. And I refuse any offense of the curse in Jesus' name. Well, Luke 6, 38, it says give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You say, I believe it, I receive it, I call it done in Jesus' name. Amen, so be it. If you're a tither, Malachi 3.10 says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time 
time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts, and all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. I believe it, I receive it, I call it done, I choose the blessing in Jesus' name. Amen, so be it. Dad, back to you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, you know, I was um, I was listening to Krista, and I want to tell you something. We what we need to do is I think I think right now. Now this is turning very serious all at once, and I mean that was serious too. But what we need to do is, um, you know, the greatest the the move of God that saved, and I call it a move. You know, move of God. It was an outpouring or. A, an awakening or, or whatever you want to call it, revival. And we, they called it the Jesus Revolution, the Jesus Freaks. I was, um, I was looking at some older prophecies last night, and, and uh, I had said Jesus Freaks, and I was referring to that move. And, and that is, was in like 1968, went to like 1972. But I want to tell you something. I want you to listen to me. As when God does his biggest thing, which is a revival, then uh, Satan does his biggest thing, which is war. He tries to start a war in order to stop revival. And uh, Vietnam broke out in that time. You know, it was all going on in that time. And it was to stop and every soldier that fought in Vietnam was a hero to me. They, they were heroes. They were, they were doing more than anybody's probably told them. Not only was they stopping the enemy, but Satan was trying to stop a revival. And our, they were fighting on really two fronts, spirit and physical. I mean, I believe that it was a spiritual but started war. And, uh, but it was to hinder that movement. But it was during that movement that we had this great awakening among the youth and the young people. And uh, now it's getting ready to start up again. It's not going to start something new. It's, pro it's a continuation of what was. And now it's going to be a Jesus revolution in this time. And when it is, they're already, you see China kicking up its heels. Uh, they're talking about Russia. And you have to remember something. The bear was ready to go home just about a month or so ago. It's talking about just stopping, going back, and cease fire and this and that. It was this country that said, oh, no, 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 no. We're sending tanks, us in Germany, anything to keep it escalated. Well, anybody knows knows this. And so what you're dealing with is that Satan, uh, they, they have their own agenda to put a world leader over the whole world, uh, the globalist and so forth. But in the spirit, they're trying to kick up, Satan wants to kick up a war to stop the Jesus revolution. Just like before, he wants to start it in the Jesus revolution and uh, to stop it. And so he wants to start it during that. So what we have to do as intercessors, if you're an intercessor, begin to pray to put down the war drums, to put them down, put down war drums, start putting it down to where people are not, you know, this thing don't escalate anymore. It just, you're absolutely, uh, we, this is our, our priority right now. We must see this revival. We must. And they're going to come in. And they're going to have all different color hair. Some of them won't have any. Some of them may not have hair and have stuff drawn on top of their bald head. Some of them may have long hair and have feathers hanging everywhere in it. Some of them may have tattoos all over their nose, all over their chins, all over their body and big gauges. Some of them will come in with cowboy hats and, and keen toe boots and where cowboys are getting born again. There's going to be all kinds, all colors, all sizes, all heights. And some of them can come in and say, and they'll get born again and so radically turned on, they'll go back to their friends, and the, one of them will say, uh, the, their friend will look at them, and they'll have this different look about them. And their friend will say, what the hell happened to you? 
And they'll look at them and say, hell, man, you got to come down here and check this out. I mean, these people, man, I'm going to tell you what. I mean, and they'll start talking to each other. Man, you know, I walked in there, and I'll tell you, I, I walked there. I didn't know what the hell was going on. I come in there and held my hands up, started praising God because the rest of the crowd was doing it, and I'll be damned if I didn't get saved. <laughs> now, that's the way they're going to talk. That's the way they're going to act. And they don't, know any, they don't know anything else. That's their world. And you're not going to be able to stand there and say, oh, 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 look at you, oh, man. No, you're not going to be able to do that. Some of the religious crowd that is going to judge the Jesus freak movement or the Jesus revolution are the Lazaruses. It's not the lost people that are the Lazaruses. It's the religious people. It's the people that are in church. Lazarus was a believer. He wasn't a against Jesus. And he had to have his grave clothes taken off. And some of the religious crowd's going to have to have their grave clothes taken off of them and quit being so culturally captive that you are absolutely no good to anybody unless they're assembly of God. Or unless there's some, or unless they're, Church of God or something, and unless there's, they fit into your culturally captive audience, then they can't possibly be right. But yet one of them talking like that lays hands on somebody and they grow a foot out on the end of their leg. Now what are you going to do? Well, Jesus was healing all kinds of sickness, disease, maimed, blind, and they still said he had a demon. Because they were culturally captive within their own culture. Do you know what the word cult comes from? The word cult comes from the word cultus. Do you know where we get that word from? It's culture. So you know what a, a cult is? I didn't say occult. I said cult. Do you know what a cult is? The literal definition would be someone who worships their own belief. Someone who worships their own belief. That's a cult. You have to be ready to look at them. I remember one man of God said he was in another nation, and he was sitting down to eat at their dinner table. And they, here they come. They come around pouring wine in these glasses. And he's thought, oh, Lord, here it comes, here it comes. Because he don't, he don't drink wine. And he's thinking, I'm about to offend everybody. And all of a sudden, before they poured his, they looked down at him and said, Brother, is it true that American Christians drink coffee? To them, that was completely wrong. See, you get, you get into a, a hole, you're captured by your own culture, and you've built a cult without knowing it. You're worshiping your own belief. Some of the things I do or I don't do, you might do, but I do it for a different reason. I, do it, I, I don't do certain things so I can keep my head clear enough to hear the Lord. I want to hear him, what he's saying to me, because I'm a prophet. I walk in that realm, and I don't want to miss something. And, and if, I, if I watch something or something that's not necessarily wrong, it just clouds my mind, and I think of those scenes of that. The images or scenes are the plot of this movie, which may have been the cleanest movie on television. But if it's not feeding my spirit, it, it, sometimes it clouds my hearing. It may not yours. You may hear in it. So, you know, we have to begin to get prepared. Start getting our grave clothes off. Start taking them off. Start getting rid of those things that have entrapped us in our own culture. Because I'm telling you, there's a bunch coming that absolutely don't know your culture. And they don't know they're doing anything wrong. I remember listening to the power team years ago on TBN. And they gave their testimony. I think his name was Ken, one of them, and, and John Jacobs. But one of them was Ken. Uh, I, I, I don't remember their names now, but. I remember them talking about it, and they said we were just, you know, they were just 
street people and everything else just living the way they lived in their California lifestyle and said, then they get born again and they don't know what to do. They didn't know where to go to church. So they went back home to their apartment, gathered together on Sunday, I think it was, and they started worshiping God to Hotel California by the Eagles. They just put on Hotel California and started worshiping God. And, and you know what? God accepted their worship because it was coming out of a heart that was absolutely pure. But all they knew was it was spiritual. They didn't realize it was the wrong spirit at the moment. It was just spiritual to them. And so they start worshiping God. I'm telling you, man, it's going to be people, praise God, with a beer in their right hand, their left hand up in the air, worshiping God. Now they're going to do it. And what you've got to do is be patient enough to let the Lord deal with all of that. You just get them turned on to Jesus. And he drew them or, or they wouldn't have came to start with. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, it's been a good 11th hour, hasn't it? I'm trying to think if I've left anything out today that we need to tell. And um, people say, Brother Robin, you, you kinda, you're kind of rough about this stuff, aren't you? Well, we don't have a whole lot of time left we've got in this world. I mean, uh, this world's changing so fast, and we got to make the most of the time we're in. And if the, if Jesus don't return before, you know, I'm in my 90s, I want to know I made every single decision I could to see the gospel come on the scene. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, it's been a good 11th hour today. I want you to keep your eyes on the on our itinerary. And we're going to be doing some things coming up in the future. It's going to be a wonderful time. Uh, look at Church International and see what's going on there. Uh, there's going to be all kinds of things there in August. You know, the tribal nations are coming. And, and uh, a prophet, Amanda Grace, is coming in uh, this month, isn't it? Who, who will? Yeah, Drenda and Gary Cassie will be at Church International this Sunday, man. I didn't know it was that quick on us. Well, that's awesome, Drenda and Gary. Come on, man. Come on. We're going to have a time. I mean, <laughs> we're going to have a time. We had a time at their church. We took an 11th hour team up there to Ohio, man, and we had a time with them. So y'all come on and uh, bring whoever you want to bring with you. And we're going to invite everybody to come. Just everybody come on. And then prophets are coming, man. We, we're this awesome time to be alive. Amen. Well, until next time we gather together right here in the fortress around God's Word, I want you to remember, never forget that God is absolutely good. Say it, Krista. Shalom, shalom.